Ladies and gentlemen, the School of Communication at Taylor's University welcomes you to our Making Sense of Journalism Through Big Data Public Forum. This is a joint collaboration with the Malaysian Multimedia Development Corporation and Big Data Malaysia. And it is sponsored by our main sponsor, ABN Access, which is Malaysia's first digital cable TV network, and co-sponsors Times Bookstore, Red Bull International, and Kuala Lumpur Convention Center. Before I begin, just a few housekeeping rules. During the proceedings, please turn off all your mobile phones, or at least please put it on silent mode. We are also being broadcast uh, live currently uh, at the site mentioned in the slides early on. All right, that we are going, we are having a live streaming. All right, for those who are not able to be with us uh, this afternoon. Okay. Um, so you may want to inform your friends who would like to be here but couldn't make it. You can please, you can give them the uh, website address. Also, you can interact with us immediately if you log on to todaysmeet.com. Big data journalism. All right, todaysmeet.com/slash big data journalism. All right and you can have your responses coming up on the projector screen to my right. Mm -hmm. All right, so without much further ado, I would like to invite Ms. Josephine Tan, the Dean from our School of Communication, to present her welcoming speech. Hi, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to all of you, and also a warm welcome to our distinguished speakers, industry partners, the media, fellow academics from public and private universities, staff and students to this public forum, making sense of journalism through Big Data in conjunction with Big Data Week. Now, in 1991, in the Philadelphia Inquirer published an expose on America, what went wrong by Ballard and Steele, which explained the reasons behind economic and social breakdown in the U.S. by analyzing over 70 years of income tax data. A breakthrough milestone in computer-assisted reporting that used big amount of data for such long years. This extensive data analysis opened up new ways of journalism that does not simply rely on interviews or press release as sources for evidence-based newsworthy stories vital for public interest. So today, the School of Communications at Taylor's University, together with Multimedia Development Corporation Malaysia and Big Data Malaysia, are proud to host a panel on how big data is undertaken in the field of journalism and various concerns revolving this practice. We hope that to promote data journalism as a way to enhance traditional investigative journalism, by providing avenues of growth, such as this forum, which we organize in conjunction with the Global Big Data Week that is running from 5th to 11 May. It is also timely that this falls on the week of World Press Freedom Day, as we believe data journalism can be a catalyst towards insightful, intelligent, and freer news reporting, and thus promoting active citizenry. There are still challenges in making data journalism successful, which among others comprise of software and technical concerns, understanding effective informed processes and making ethical decisions. At Taylor's University, we would like to enhance teaching and learning in terms of analytical tools used to tabulate data, the expertise in analyzing them, and ensure we honour the ethical nature of such investigative journalism using big data. Hence, our four panellists here, all of whom are renowned experts, are willing to share their knowledge in a field that we at Taylor's University aspire to champion. We thank the reputable speakers 
Prof. Professor Zaharun Naim from Nottingham University Malaysia campus, Dr. Wong Ching Huat from Penang Institute, and Ms. Irene J. Liu from Thomson Reuters, Hong Kong, and Ahmad Kamal from Polytrick for coming here to share with us their expertise. So we hope that it will be a fruitful and insightful experience for all of us today. Thank you once again, ladies and gentlemen, for your presence here at this forum, and I hope you will enjoy learning together. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Josephine Tan. Now we would like to welcome Ms. Pak Mi Yue, who is the Head of Technology and Research Department from the Malaysian Multimedia Development Corporation to present her speech. Good afternoon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Right. Um, on behalf of Multimedia Development Corporation, we thank Taylor's University for running this big data event on data journalism for the second year in a row. Um, I recall last year I was a participant uh, in a part of the audience and I remember the highlight of last year was GE13 and it attracted an overwhelming uh, turnout far exceeding the room capacity. And in fact, for today, uh, I could see that this room size is at least three times uh, bigger than the one that was held last year. So, uh, very impressive uh, turnout for today. Um, there is no denying that we live in this well-connected world. Everyone has a Facebook, everyone has a mobile, and we see convergence of cloud, mobility, internet of things, and big data. Every minute, voluminous amount of data is added via YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and so on. Big data is essentially the three Bs. Uh, volume, variety, structured and unstructured data, and uh, velocity, data on the move, making, uh, making it uh, harder for uh, people to analyze data. So, um, big data, no doubt, it has the, the terminology big, but it doesn't have to be big. Uh, you can start with a small data, uh, but uh, it, it ensure that there is a variety of data so that uh, because uh, in, the, in the past analytic used to be done on structured data and the tools that were used were meant solely for structured data. So there is a need for uh, new tools that will actually mine the unstructured, unstructured data like for example video, uh, graphs, images. So big data by itself does not make sense until you apply data analytics. Then you will get gold mine of value from your data. Big data analytics enables endless possibilities ranging from making predictions of a shopper's buyer patterns, what will happen, giving prescriptions of a future event, how to make it happen. In turn, it will actually increase your revenue where to increase your advertising spend, to maximize your return on investment, increases productivity with the ability of data, um, and as well as it will help you make an informed decision in a faster and timely manner. In a data-centric journalism, you may uncover untold stories from the different data variety. The challenge lies in discerning which data is a fact or a fiction or lies. Big data analytics should be first tackled from business problems or case perspective and then thereafter identify the technologies that are best suited to tackle the business problems. Big data technologies are plentiful, especially when they are open source. We are also championing the open data concept for private sector. We understand media and marketing research companies have tons of data. If you could share it to the public, the individual developers or students may potentially uh, marry different data sets and try to make data discoveries 
and develop applications for the greater good. We welcome you to work with us on this open data concept for private sector. Um, in terms of market demand, Gartner reported that global big data investment in 2013 continued to rise with 64% of organizations investing or planning to invest in big data technology compared with 58% from 2012. From the regional perspective, North America continues to lead the investments for big data analytics. However, Asia Pacific is coming in a close second with its ambitious plans to invest in big data over the next two years. MDEC believes that Malaysia is ready to embrace the vast opportunities that big data analytics has to offer as we sow the seeds to grow Malaysia into a developed country driven by the digital economy by 2020. In our Digital Malaysia Roadmap DM354, big data analytics forms an integral part of ICT services, which together with four other key digital economy subsectors, namely e-commerce, ICT manufacturing, ICT trade, as well as content and media, are required to grow at a Kager growth of 9.8% from 2010 to 2020 for the Malaysian eco digital economy to achieve the aspirational goal of 17% contribution to national GDP. So, um, I would like to encourage everyone uh, to participate in um, working together to develop the big data analytics ecosystem in Malaysia. Um, that's all, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Park Mei Yue. Without further ado, we would like to invite Ms. Sandra Henshin, who is the Organizing Chair for Big Data Malaysia, to present her welcoming speech. Distinguished guests, it is my great honor to be addressing you on behalf of Big Data Malaysia at this fantastic data journalism forum hosted by Taylors. In Malaysia, there is growing cultural acceptance that big data can enhance the capabilities of organizations, although adoption of big data is at varying levels of maturity. We are now observing a transition phase from curiosity and enthusiasm to implementation across startup and enterprise scale bodies. Media companies that employ journalists are part of this movement. This groundswell of interest fuels the basis of Big Data Malaysia, a networking group for professionals of interest in all things big data. This includes data science, visualization, use cases, open data, and more. Our community has welcomed participation from computer scientists to data journalists, reflecting a broad societal interest in big data. They say that data is the new oil. Demand for open data for both private and public sector use is increasing for endeavours such as data journalism. In Malaysia, complex social problems such as traffic congestion or access to health services may be tackled by open data and crowdsourcing approaches. In our recent report, Big Data in Malaysia, Emerging Sector Profile 2014, 40% of respondents told us that having access to government data will create valuable big data opportunities for them. Respondents were after demographic and socio-economic information, data related to crime, ethnicity, border security, location, community finance, and even the weather. All of these topics are relevant to data journalism. Big data not just involves technological evolution, but a cultural shift in values, including transparency, innovation, and creativity. The advent of big data brings rapid change, but also renews interests in classical disciplines such as mathematics. But there are many pitfalls. Statisticians warn us that correlations do not equal causation, and that the availability of more variables does not guarantee greater clarity. The privacy rights of individuals will also constrain how organisations manage data. In Malaysia, the Personal Data Protection Act has been gazetted recently, and it remains to be seen how adequate the legislation is in protecting the interests of individuals while encouraging data projects. However, we at Big Data Malaysia believe that the productive value of big data analytics in societies outweighs drawbacks and these concerns are respected and managed carefully. We believe big data industries will support not only Malaysia's competitiveness in the global, MDEC, in the global economy, as MDEC have outlined, 
but that it will also support the nation's cohesiveness through endeavours such as data journalism. Through big data and traditional principles of journalism, there is a path for us to illuminate and address societal problems. I don't want to steal any of the speaker's quotes today, so I'm going to go back to Plato in the Republic to illustrate what I believe data journalism can do. Plato says, Behold, human beings living in an underground den, which has a mouth open towards the light and reaching all along the den. Above and behind them is a fire. A fire is blazing at a distance, and between the fire and the prisoners there is a raised way. And you will see, if you look, a low wall built along the way, like the screen which marionette players have in front of them, over which they show the puppets. Investigative data journalism may help us to see beyond the murkiness and illusions of big data to understand what is really going on in society. Big Data Malaysia would like to congratulate Taylor's University School of Communication for their foresight and innovation in hosting today's program, following on from the successful inaugural event last year. I am very excited to hear from the very high calibre of speakers that Taylor's University have assembled for you here today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sandra Henshaw. And now we will move on to our main event. Let me introduce to you my colleague, Ms. Kalai Jyoti Sahadevan, who is the moderator of this forum. Jyoti will introduce our panel uh, of speakers, but before that, just a brief description to our students here who are still not so clear about what big data is all about. This public forum is aiming to provide uh, aims to provide an avenue for you to understand, analyze, and interpret huge data sets of information and numbers and how, if properly narrated, it can bring meaning to everything that matters to us in a daily, on our uh, daily basis, All right? in a way that we can comprehend easily and uh, effectively. I'm sure our esteemed speakers here will definitely do more justice to explain it clearly to you. So Jyoti, over to you now. Thank you for being here. Be compelled here. Yeah? No, I know you're all interested. Okay, without further ado, uh, just uh, some uh, information about how it's going to be done. Uh, this, uh, uh, mod I'll be the moderator, and we have four speakers here. Uh, <clears throat> I will start with uh, that each of the speaker uh, will have about 15 to 20 minutes to speak. We'll roughly finish about uh, 4 to 4:15. After that, you have any questions? Uh, you can ask. We have about one hour for questions. Huh? They have so much of knowledge to share with us, uh, but we are giving them a short while only to present yeah? their big uh, uh, you know, uh, information that we gather for so long, because you can ask relevant questions and uh, then they can uh, appropriately answer. Okay. Okay, I would like to uh, invite all the speakers to come forward. Uh, starting from Mr. Ahmad Kamal Nawa, uh, Dr. Wong Ching Ha, Ms. Arlene Jolil, and Professor Zahalo. I will first read the biodata of our first speaker. Uh, Mr. Ahmad Kamal is a researcher with Polytweet who graduated with a Bachelor of Computer Science from Monash University and has been working in various disciplines within the IT industry for over 11 years. Uh, he's into game development, data-driven animation, pixel art, database uh, architecture and analytics. And he also worked, uh, I think maybe on some of his uh, most defined work would be in constituency uh, matters, uh, especially understanding local politics. For anyone to uh, understand, you can actually Google for poly, uh, polytweet.org, uh, which is a non-partisan uh, research firm analyzing interactions among Malaysians using social media. Uh, who have been monitoring politics and activism uh, since uh, through Twitter since uh, 2009 and expanded to include Facebook. Uh, his title today, very interestingly, is using Twitter as a resource for journalists uh, in relation to big data. All of us use Twitter, right? Does anyone here do not use Twitter? See, I know all, all our students are really, uh, you know, 
that will make it very relevant to you. And now uh, we present uh, Mr. Ahmad Kamal Jayo.
Bn is short form for been, as in been there, done that. And Linus is a common family name in Australia and UK. And Jalan Sultan also exists in Jakarta. And it's a very common problem with any road name. So quite often there's a big issue here, but I cannot track it online because there's always a lot of Indonesian tweets that can't be filtered up. So the workaround is to search for co-related words. Search for BN or PR. Or search for PKR or PAS. So any tweet that contains both PKR and PAS is going to be the relevant tweet. So you end up getting some data instead of no data. Okay, so now you have, you have collected the data. Now you, uh, next step is to identify the relevant data. You have to decide what is relevant to you or your readers. And develop a filter based on that data. What, what to keep and what to discard. So for example, during the Kajang flood a few years back, we tracked Banjie. But uh, Banjie is also common in Indonesia and apparently happens quite often in Jakarta. So I ended up with a lot of tweet Indonesian tweets that had to be filtered out. And you can also apply the geolocated filter, that means tweets that are geotagged with Malaysian coordinates. You keep those and you just cut the rest, that's another way. But only about 5-10% of tweets have a uh, geo-coordinate embedded in them. So once you whittle down your earlier set of data, you work the subset. And there are two ways to analyze data. The first is to read individual tweets, which can be very time-consuming if you're dealing with thousands of tweets. And the second is to try and summarize. You can try to find the most retweeted tweets per hour. But the problem with the most retweeted tweets is it reflects the opinion of popular people and not popular opinion, because most users of Twitter uh, chit-chat in a small social network. And it's difficult to summarize popular opinion without a manual reading. So I'll give you an example from uh, Black 505 last year. Okay, this is a network diagram of people talking about Black 505. Each username is uh, represented as a node, which is a circle. And the nodes are connected to each other based on their conversation. So all these people who are connected to Anwar are tweeting to him. And this is a zoomed in version. The bottom right is a zoomed out version. So, yeah. so you can see that connected network is actually just a small portion of this larger sphere. Because all of these little dots are actually just like pairs or maybe very small networks of four or five people talking to each other about Black 505 and you'll never see their tweets without actually reading through the data because they won't get the tweets. So another popular analytical tool is uh, word clouds, which are easy to generate using model.net. And the word cloud visualizes the most common words. The more common the word, the larger the font size. But it can be quite misleading. It's best to look at it after you understand the topic as a whole. <coughs> So this is a word cloud of Versailles 3 tweets by users and not politicians. Uh, Versailles 3 took place on April 28th plus uh, two years ago. And from this, it's not so easy to make sense of the relation between the words. Uh, see like on the right here you have kafir, but what is related to kafir you don't know because it's not connected. You have crater, if you know about the car being overturned then you know what that crater means, otherwise you won't know. So this is how a word cloud can be a little confusing or even irrelevant. So one thing that we are working on is a related word, interactive word cloud. That means if I click on if I click on Kafir, then personally I think the most common related word would be Ambika. So that would be highlighted. So the word cloud then becomes useful if I click on Tataran and then Merdeka becomes highlighted. And one thing you can do now is to compare two different word clouds. So these are it's the same word cloud, but on the left we have uh, a word cloud generated by what Pakatan politicians tweeted 
during that same period. And comparing the Pakatan Politician Work Club and the Work Club by the users, you see Amiga is not on the left. But Najib is prominent on the, in the Politician's Work Club. So the politicians were tweeting more about Najib, and the users were not. And that, that is one clear difference in how the, the politicians and the users <coughs> treated per se three at that time. Okay, uh, next come to verifying information. Uh, two more main methods. First is to directly contact the Twitter users and ideally try to meet them or contact them over the phone and just to verify that what they're saying is true. And over time you get to identify who are the people who are giving reliable information on Twitter. And what I normally do is use alternate sources of information like YouTube and Facebook and media reports to see what correlates with what I see on Twitter. Because Twitter is a very good source of news, but it's also a good source of rumors and uh, false facts. So then you have to decide and to infer what is reliable. The more people tweet about the same event, the more likely it is true. And geolocated tweets are even better because you know what time and where they were when you tweeted something, especially a photo. So I give an example from Mercedes 3 as to who broke the barricade. So there are two versions of that story. One was the police removed the barricade and gave way for the crowd to come in. And the other is the crowd broke the barricade and forced the police to run away. So, from the tweets and also the video, both versions are true depending on where you're standing in the crowd. So on the left is uh, this girl who cheated that the barrier has been removed and they're ready to go in. And on the left is not inside the photo, but actually a, a mob of police on the left. And she's somewhere around here on the far edge. And on the right is a screenshot from a YouTube video when Asmin was giving a speech and then when he stepped down, the crowd pushed away the barricades and then they rushed in. And at the same moment that that happened here, where the crowd rushed in, the police standing over here, just on this girl's left, they started running away and somebody else tweeted, the police are running away. So this is where the confusion comes about. So, the crowd on the far edge saw the police running away, they thought it's okay to go through, they have permission, or who knows what they're thinking. But then, on the left of the side of the crowd, you have the crowd rushing through, pushing away the barricade. So the order of events is a little different, even though they happen like within a few seconds of each other. The crowd broke through the barricade, the police pulled back to let the FIU handle the crowd. Okay, next we go on to building timelines. So tweet X is a historical record, and this is about the same two, which took place in 2011. The goal of the stadium Merdeka, and we collected 85,000 tweets from 19,000 users. In addition to that, we also collected 17,000 mentions of locations. So coming back to that Jalan Sultan example I talked about earlier. So all the main streets in town were identified, and tweets were collected on that. So the method is based on what I said earlier. Identifying the most repeated tweet for each hour, identifying the peak time periods for the event and for the locations, and then starting to view the tweeted images in sequence, and combine that with videos, Facebook, blogs, and so on, to try and separate what was a separate rumor from fact. So these are the tweets per hour from 1 a.m. to Midnight. The lower line representing users and the upper line representing tweets. So the peak hour was 4 o'clock. And these small graphs show the same the level of tweets or level of mentions for each place per hour. So you can see, for example, Pula um, which is where the game is open held, it started to peak around 3-4 o'clock. 
and early in the day people gathered in Masjid Jamid. So it is in peak earlier. So all these little graphs help to identify where were the hot spots during the day. And based on all that data, we can start to construct a timeline of what happened. So starting from the morning when people were making the journey to the city and complaining about roadblocks. And arrests have been being made at the KTM and LRT. And more arrests being made at 10 o'clock in the morning. False report of tear gas at KLCC. And these are the tweeted images. Uh, 11 o'clock, more people being arrested. <coughs> 12 o'clock, even more arrests, and crowds are starting to gather and move in Central Market of Downing Street. So at 1 o'clock, tear gas started being fired, water cannons started being used, and a massive crowd gathered at the Jan Sultan to the Raya, and the electricity stations were closed. So it's all at Pulu Raya. So at 2 o'clock, police action continues. Then the crowd breaks up. One section goes to Tungshin Hospital, another section goes to PLCC. And the earlier crowd at Jalan Sultan and Jalan were they had no police action taken against them, and they were completely oblivious. They were, I think they were um, having a fun fair of sorts outside there. And the same Pakistan leaders were tear gas at KL Central. So at 2.30, police action continues. Tear gas is fired to Tongshin's hospital grounds. And the crowd at Stadium Medeka remains calm. More arrests continue to be made. Up to 4 o'clock, the crowd starts to disperse. So again, this is how all these uh, tweet levels match what was being tweeted as to the hotspots. So now we know where the crowd was and where they were moving and then all those photos. We can use all that to do a quick crowd estimation. So this is the Pudu Raya crowd. This is all the photos. And we can use Google Maps to measure the surface area and then estimate roughly how many people were there which in this case was close to 32,000 people. So, moving on to rumors of blackouts during GD. We collected all the tweets about blackouts during the night itself. And 70% of those tweets were just retweets of other users complaining about blackouts. But the majority of them were not tweeting about anything specific. They were just repeating rumours. Uh, these were the tweets per minute. Yeah, tweets per minute, keyword blackout on voting day. So it started around 8 o'clock and slowly went higher and higher until about the wee hours in the morning. And this was a timeline that we built from the tweets, which were all like, subject to verification. But it also allowed us to see <coughs> uh, which was the first reported place that had a blackout. <coughs> Especially in the Bahan time, where there was rumors of tear gas, which was not true, but it prompted local Mangsa residents to come out and defend the school from what they thought was people trying to bring in more votes. And this is the only photo of a blackout that we found among all those tweets. And the person that tweeted this image was not actively tweeting about politics and never followed up on this. It was just one image that was just tweeted up. So in summary, people believed in the blackouts without evidence. And the specific seats that uh, were listed just now were not verifiable or there's proven to have no blackout. And misinformation about election results, like say Pakistan is leading when there's only like 5 to 10 percent of vote counted, that helped to fuel the, the rumor mill. And all this data is like a case study of how social media can spread rumors fast. Okay, uh, measuring local interest. I need one slide here. Uh, these are heat maps. The one above are uh, users tweeting about the general election during the campaign week. So, most the, the 
the, the area cover is a bit exaggerated, but it's just enough to show that most of Peninsula and Sabah and Sarawak were covered by users tweeting about the elections. And the one on the bottom is the uh, blackout, the, the, the Swara Riot, Swara Krabat Rally on May 8th. And Sabah and Sarawak, there's hardly any interest from their side. So when you apply this approach to other political topics, you start to see patterns in which users in which states have more interest in certain topics. And yeah, that's the end of the presentation. In a joint venture, uh, uh, engage a joint uh, venture, delineation, uh, sorry, delineation, uh, it's a mouthful for me, action and research team, uh, what more the research work itself, right? Uh, more constituency uh, uh, categorization of uh, voters pattern. And if you had uh, Google, uh, if you had Googled his name earlier, you would know he is also a well-known columnist for online media including FZ.com, The Malaysian Insider and The Nutgraph. Uh, he will be speaking numbering and mapping democracy, how to make your grandma understand and participate constituency redelineation. Welcome Dr. Wong. Uh, th thanks to uh, Taylor University for inviting me on this. Uh, my presentation will be slightly different from uh, the previous one. Uh, mine, would, for the, because of the subject matter itself, so that the technology we are developing, you would not see uh, that much of uh, data mining. But it will be much more straightforward. But there's a word that would connect us, uh, crop and crop sourcing. Uh, we'll come to that very quickly. Uh, while we wait, uh, let, me, let me just go on with the slides that what I'm going to talk about. Uh, until two years ago, I was a journalism lecturer. So, and I'm sure that you, you guys may be wondering and say, you know, how does... Today, I'm more of a political scientist, but when we come to read nation, I'm actually an activist. So, how does journalism connect with activism? There's parts that actually link, back, link them back together. If you recall your newsworthiness, on one hand, you have things that merely just really more of entertaining, odd and unusual uh, conflict. We all like to see people fighting, human interest, uh, prominence. Then, in between somewhere, people look at uh, questions like, even look at uh, uh, questions like proximity, timeliness, currency, what people are talking about. Now, on the other end, what you have to me is what is most important. What's the last criterion of newsworthiness that I have not mentioned? Impact. Impact. Because that's what really we should be, right? Journalism should not be just about gossiping. Although that's how we all started about news. Uh, now, how do you link journalism to activism then? What is, what is actually common here? I think if you go back to what real, what I consider real substantial journalism is about, uh, it's not going to follow up by, you know, whichever movie star, what they're going to do, who do they think, and so on. But about two things. One, how do we check the power of the state? What you call the Ford estate? you know, as a watchdog to the government. The second is to enable democratic self-governance. In other words, to minimize the need for the government to intervene in our life so that we can organize it the way we want it. I would say it's the same thing that activism should pursue, or at least in the fields that we're working on. That's what we're actually looking at. We want to check the power of the government, and we want to make as far as possible, government not necessary in ordering our life. In other words, if people can find way to organize things instead of depending on state power, then we should. Are we here? Great. If not, then you. Just... Sorry for that technical hiccup. I wanted to use my computer because that I have Google Earth on that, but. Uh, 
and just talk you to death. Now, and, and why we put your grandma there? That doesn't mean that I'm meant to be sexist. But in Malaysia, most people would probably would not be surprised if your grandfather talked a lot about politics. Your grandmother probably would be seen as apolitical because it's too complicated, uh, you know, uh, too boring, too dirty. But the point here, the work that I'm doing and my colleagues are doing, uh, my name is over there from Brazil Secretariat, what we are doing is to get ordinary people to get involved. So the task to me would be say, if one day I get a grandmother and say, this is how I draw my constituency, then I would say, yeah, that's perhaps we have work. Okay, so where journalism meets activism, uh, as I mentioned just now. Now, I think the question here is that how do we not feel overwhelmed and helpless in this crowded world, crowded in both senses. The world is getting bigger and bigger, which means each of us becomes smaller and smaller. Secondly, our society is crowded with information. You have just look at the previous presentation. Look at the numbers of tweeters that were emerged by the minutes. I think the solution is to say, be informed and be involved. One, link you to journalism. The other one, link you to activism. That's where the topic that what I'm doing and what you are doing, me. Uh, if you follow, uh, there will be discussion about what you call slow journalism. You know, participatory, you get people to provide you sources and so on, but you have just seen part of it. Instead of getting just to come up with something very quick, very short, that's one end of where the technology goes. But the other end is actually to say, now let's get more people to tell a more, a fuller story. That's what I see. That's the same thing that what will connect what I call chamber activism. I mean, just now we talk about per se. That's street activism. That's what I've been in uh, for the past few years. I probably will still be there. But I think that's equally important is people getting things done. Doing activism by manipulating data, to by analyzing it, by debunking myth. Uh, this is what uh, happened just about uh, over the weekend in Tengganu. This is a bunch of ordinary people. They were trying out the maps and so on, how to draw their constituency for Kuala Kinabaru, Kuala Tengganu, and Kuala Nurus. Why a chamber? I mean. Eventually, this is the type of constant, uh, activism that's going to take place by changing public decision in courtroom, in legislative chamber, in conference room. You are not talking about the number of physical strength. You are talking about the number of power. Pow uh, the power of, not the power of number, but the power of knowledge of information. So what has it got to do with data? Uh, this is an old quote. Benjamin Disraeli say that there are three types, three kinds of life: lies, damn lies, and statistics. And everyone playing with quantitative method would know that there are ways to cheat and there are ways not to be cheated. So the big data here, I think, what is important in both your work and our work is that first you have to investigate. And I always like these quotes: news is what somebody somewhere wants to suppress. All the rest is advertising. To inform, how do you make the important thing interesting? You might think that it's important, but why should people care? The last part, of course, is to get involved. This is explicit in, journal explicit in activism, but implicit in, in journalism as well. And this is what we're going to do, uh, constituency redilation. <coughs> I have to touch on five issues that will go very, very quickly. The first is six words disproportionality. You wonder what it is. This is what it is. If you can see the yellow bar, that's the percentage of votes won by the major party. The blue bars would be the percentage of seats. And then the red bar is dividing the blue bar by the yellow bar. In other words, Barisan National got 126% of what it's both share warrant. So it got more than what it is, while pass on the other end got only 
That's what you mean by disproportionality. This is how unfair, how does it violate people? Why is this important? They come back to the question, impact relevance. Why should you care? Now, you probably would feel that, how do I get all these things in my mind? So we have to think about way. Bear in mind that I'm not talking to the weekend, you know, over the weekends when I go, and my colleagues when we go on to uh, root shows in small towns and so on, we are not talking to university students. We are talking to people who may not, you know, have that much education as you do. So, think of it, we will put it and say, now if you can buy, consider your, compare your wood with your bank note. If you can buy one kilogram of sugar with one ringgit, BNs go in and you'll get 1.26 kilo, and PKR and pass 0.64, you combine all the position together 0.79. What does it mean? It means that one dollar for BN is almost twice the dollar for pass. Now this is how we summarize data. So the other end is different from, this is much more straightforward, but this is how do you plug the number? How do you turn something into a, a soundbite, if you like? The sum right here is that one word for BN was equivalent to two words for pass in G13. Do you think that's right? If it's not right, you've got to do something. Do you think it's all right? Is that fair? What if I tell you that's actually the fairest result we have ever had in the history? You would believe it? This is it. These are all the same data I run through like from GE minus 1, that's the election before independence of Malaya, all the way to 13 GE, that's 14 elections, I sorted all these things out, and these are the data. Because most people wouldn't have time for you to go into the detail, you need to plug the most important gist of that and tell people. This is what I would tell people. 1986, PASS was the second largest opposition party. One word for PASS, one word for BN, was equivalent to 40 votes for PASS. How could that happen? Because PASS won 15% of votes, but only won one seat in a parliament that consisted of 177, 177 seats. So one vote for the ruling party was equivalent to 40 votes to the large, second largest opposition. These are the things we need to tell people and say, impact is here. You need, to be, you need to make a call whether you want to let all this thing happen. Now, the issue, malapportionment. This is probably most people would have heard about that Putradaya is actually, you have 15,000 uh, voters, Kappa, two hours from Putradaya have 144,000 voters. So that's what you call malapportionment, or disparity. One constituency that's so small, almost one tenth of the other. But there were different parts of that because, first of all, you have different, the malapportionment partly was between the states because every state were given different number. And second, between the states, there are different. So I'm not going to detail, but this, all you see here, every little chips of that show you the size of the constituency. But we break them into 13 states, uh, sorry, 16 all of them. So you can see between every state what's the spread. And also you look at the yellow bar here, would mean the average. So you can compare which one is caused by uh, interstate male apportionment or intrastate male apportionment. Because one, for one, the interstate, the parliament is responsible, for the other one, the EC is responsible. Uh, we also have to simplify what you have in the law. This is the constitution. It will say the numbers of electors between each constituency in the state ought to be approximately equal, except that da, 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 the country district, that's mean the rural districts can be bigger. So we have to summarize it and say equal apportionment is the rule, but you can have exception to benefit the states, uh, the rural constituency. So what we need then is to actually look through the numbers of constituency you're talking about. 222 at the moment, and you know, for parliament. 
and we find out the anomaly, actually not so much anomaly, but the proof of how the EC has basically violated the constitutional provision. This is Baling. How many of you know where Baling is? Qatar, next to Thailand border. You have 72,000. You know how to start where it is? That's the state capital, 56,000. Are you suggesting that Baling, a mountainous provincial town, is actually a metropolis, while the state capital is a small town? But that's what the EC is telling you. And this is Puchong next to us, Sri Sadang and Kinrara, between the same parliamentary constituency, once it's almost twice the others. So you have to pick up all these things because ordinary people would not be interested to go through the entire report with you. You need to pick up what is relevant, hit at what they can, and tell them that these are the situations, are you not going to do anything? And this is gerrymandering. Gerrymandering basically means that you redraw, redraw the constituency and then you benefit from it. The original constituency here would be in the middle, the boundary. So blue would win one seat, red would win one seat. If I redraw it this way, the two constituencies remain the same size, but blue party would now dominate both. This is what you call gerrymandering. You do not have to do anything. By just reducing politics into geography, you can actually win. And that's how democracy collapsed, because voters, you no longer have any instrument to control, to condition your politicians. So we look out for cases. This is, some of them are outliers. Some of them are quite common. This is Tabao, for example. I think the example this is parliamentary seats. That's Tabao. You look at the red, uh, red boundary that show you the parliamentary seats, constituency. This constituency span across four local authorities, which is color. Here, Pasir Gudang, Johor Bahru Tengah, this is uh, Johor Bahru, and this is Kulai. This one is even funnier. As you can see, the yellow part, this is actually M45 Slakklam, which is not far away from here, half an hour. You find that they are not even connected. All these are islands, and then you have an enclave in the city next to Grand Town. These are clear cut cases of gerrymandering. The easy would be bothered because in the past, no one actually cared. The data was not as complicated as the Twitter data, but it was big enough for ordinary people to say, I don't know what to do. And our job is to make it accessible. Can anyone recognize where this is? I'm asking you this question because you should, some of you should know. Can you recognize it? Jalan PJS 7 stroke 19. Now, do you notice that that is actually Subang Jaya and this is Risa Tia? In the same area, you actually have two state constituency. And Subang Jaya is represented by who? Henayo, the Speaker of the Slango Legislature. And Sri Satya is represented by Nick Nasmi, the Deputy Speaker of Slango Legislature. Ridiculous. Constituency need not to be so ridiculous, but people need to act. So, but there's one more question that's coming in from here. In Malaysia, every eight years or ten years when we redelineate re the constituency, there's also, there's always been increase of seats. And most Malaysians think that it's common. Because like, you know, you have more people, you should have more MPs. So you have to put comparative data in. This is America, 1911, 2013. The red bar shows you the size of the population. It has tripled from 94 million to 314 million. But the House of Representatives remained at 435. Nothing changed. Malaysia, as you can see, population grow, the parliament also grow by nearly 50%. 
Now, if this is not shocking enough, look at this. This is projection. The way we grow, in 75 years' time, we should have more MPs than India. Seriously, India with, with more than uh, 1 billion population would have a parliament of 552 at the maximum. The way we are growing, one day we will be done. Now, next one. But really the problem is to think about why do we get MPs into the house? We want them to talk, right? That's why you get them to represent you. In 2012, I'm sure most of you would know about this fact, our parliament met for 68 days, uh, concisely. Precisely 560 hours, 58 minutes. How do I get this number? My colleague Nicholas Chan actually come through Han Sats to get the numbers. And he didn't just get a number, but he actually did his analysis as well. What does it mean? You divide by 222 MPs, each of them got, can anyone give me the number? How long do you think that our MP had to speak and be heard? 2 hours, 31 minutes, 37 seconds. This is what I mean by sound bites. You need to plug things that people can remember and see how absurd the system is. Your MP got to Parliament in average to speak and be heard for 2 hours, 31 minutes, 37 seconds in the entire year of 2012. With more MPs, each of them get to speak less. The case is before us, whether we're going to do something or not. Uh, what do you do? Again, this is actually simplif simplification from law because it's very complicated if you tell people what you can do. Uh, when the EC started putting up their proposal, the state government can intervene, the state local government can intervene. Otherwise, it's only 100, a group of 100 or more voters. These people can put up their objections. But eventually, it will go through here. When you go to parliament, it's a simple majority that decides the new constituency. So you have to act here. Otherwise, nothing happened. So what we did is that we actually train ordinary people to do this using what? Google Earth and Excel. This is from Google Earth. Uh, you know MPSJ, right? Majis Pupandaran Subang Jaya, your local authority. Ex at, the big, at present, the red line here show MPSJ. You have one full parliamentary constituency, that's Puchong, and piece, pieces of four other parliamentary constituencies. Extremely fragmented. We get ordinary people to redraw it. Uh, this is one proposal. You end up having two, Subang, Jaya, and Sada. This is what we are doing. Now, if you are interested, that's Mandi. Mandi. Yeah. That handsome man over there. So, get in touch with us. We, are, we desperately need gigs. Seriously. You know, if no one appreciates your geeky present, come to us. We embrace you. Thank you, Dr. Wong Chinhua, for the very interesting uh, numbers uh, that we have not really seen before. Uh, save your questions again, and now we will invite uh, Ms. Irene J. Liu, all the way from Hong Kong, uh, Thomson Reuters. I really appreciate that she uh, made time to come, all, uh, left all her work pending there in Hong Kong. And uh, she's the re a reporter on the enterprise team at Thomson Reuters. Um, <clears throat> she has led the development of Reuters Connected China news uh, application which tracks and visualizes the people and institutions that make up China's power structure, which backs several journalism and design awards, including a 2013 Data Journalism Award and a special citation by the Society of American Business Editors and Writers, which called it Great Journalism Married with Great Design. Uh, this is what I would say uh, is how to get information comprehensible in a very attractive manner. Uh, Ms. Irene will be... Sorry. Ms. Irene will be able to uh, explain it further. Um, 
just a, a little in other information. Previously, she was senior reporter and special uh, projects team leader at the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong and a political reporter in Albany, New York. And uh, just a company uh, background, Thomson Reuters is a leading The leading multinational media and information firm operating worldwide for intelligent information in the financial and risk, legal, tax and accounting, intellectual property and science and media markets. She will be speaking on investigative journalism in the age of big data. Let's welcome Ms. Irene. Good afternoon everyone. Can you guys hear me in the back? Yes? Yeah. All right. Um, so, it's an honor to be here, and I hope that I can keep you guys awake for the next 20 minutes. I know, uh, you know having lots of speakers back and uh, back to back can be quite tiring. Uh, but anyway, so I, um, originally when I uh, was invited to speak, I wanted to talk about my favorite stories um, and my favorite examples of how data is being used in journalism. because. I love journalism, I love to read journalism, and I'm always inspired by the work that other people do. But Jyoti said that she wanted me to talk about my own stories, which is always a little bit awkward. So um, I thought, okay, sure, I follow orders, and so I'm gonna talk about a few stories and projects that I've worked on in my career as a reporter. I've been a journalist for seven years now. I uh, was sitting where you guys were seven years ago. Um, and at that time, it was right before the financial crisis. And uh, for those of you who, got, who don't know about the state of journalism in America, the financial crisis basically destroyed the industry for a really long time. Um, a lot of companies were laying off people and it was very hard to get a job um, right around the time when I was graduating, uh, graduating from journalism school. Um, but I have to say that, um, you know, by channeling my geekiness um, and kind of being interested in data, I was able to kind of carve a niche for myself, um, doing the kind of doing uh, the kind of work that I always wanted to get into when I was got into journalism, which was investigative reporting. And I think that nowadays. Uh, if you want a career in journalism, if you want a career in media, um, you cannot escape data. Uh, most people, when they got into journalism, they always joke that they did it so they could avoid having to do, to do math. And I think that now we really don't have an excuse. We have to be numerate, we have to really be comfortable with numbers, and um, also we just have to be comfortable with keeping up to date on all of the different ways that we get information. So uh, back in the day when you were a reporter, you could just go to press conferences or interview people and then you would write what they say. Um, if the government said, you know, we're spending more on the poor and poverty is going down, you just had to report what they said. Now we're at a point because there's more and more data out there and we have the tools and the expertise to be able to analyze that data. We don't have to take the word of companies or government or individual people. We can use data as another source to verify what they say. So this is an important and exciting time for accountability journalism. Um, and more than that, you have a lot of people who, um, you know, how many, wait, okay, how many of you guys have a Facebook profile? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you are on Twitter? Uh, LinkedIn? Okay, if you're not on LinkedIn, you really should be on LinkedIn if you want a job, just as a side point. But whatever you guys have, whatever presence you have, I should, I should be fair. Also, how many of you are on Google Plus? Okay, not as many. Um, but I think the point of all this is that you now have a digital presence, okay? If you Google yourself, most likely you'll be able to find something someone said about you or something that you said. Um, all of these social media outlets are basically avenues for you to speak your mind and share your life, but it's also an avenue for me as an investigative reporter to learn more about you. Um, and so this is, it's in some ways, depending on how private you are, this can be a good thing um, or a bad thing. But as a reporter who's trying to um, you know, hold institutions accountable and um, identify uh, trends and that sort of thing, this is an incredibly exciting time because we have the opportunity to really uh, use these tools, treat them like sources because the data is not just truth. 
you, as, as was mentioned in earlier presentations, you can use math and numbers to say anything. Uh, but it's one of those kind of things that we need to have in our toolkit to really be able to do our job well. So enough of my uh, you know, lecturing and excitement about data, let's just talk about stories. So here's one, uh, an example of a story that um, we did at the South China Morning Post a few years ago. And um, as you can see in the middle, city warned to act now on superbugs. Um, superbugs are uh, infectious diseases that are resistant to most antibiotics. They're very dangerous and quite often um, one of the most likely places that you will contract a superbug is when you're in a hospital. Um, it's really, really scary if you do contract a superbug because um, you, there's a high likelihood that um, you could fall very, very ill or even die. But it's also something that is very preventable when, if, if a hospital that you work with has, or that you're at, has um, very, very strong infection control um, procedures. So if the nurses and the doctors are always washing their hands and sanitizing everything, um, the likelihood that infection in hospitals goes down by a lot. So one of the things that we wanted to do, uh, this is when I was first, when I first moved to Hong Kong, I was looking for different stories that I, that I wanted to work on. And um, one of the things I'd come across was a story about hospital acquired infections in the UK. And what we found was that they were covering a lot of, they were doing a lot of media attention over hospital superbug deaths. And um, at one point, the government basically became involved, and the National Audit Office wrote a report that said, that was entitled Reducing Healthcare Associated Infections in Hospitals in England. And in this report, one of the things they said was, between 2001 and 2003, media and public interest in the subject grew, particularly in relation to concerns over identified increases in what the media called the superbug. So, because the media was putting its attention on this issue, then the public grew more interested in the issue, which then caused um, government to then respond. And what we found was the government, after, after a certain point, decided that they were going to release data about the number of hospital-acquired infections by hospital. So it wasn't just saying, you know, in all of the UK, you know, there were X number of, you know, infections. What they were saying is, in the hospital that is in your neighborhood, there are X number of infections. In the hospital down the street, there are fewer infections. And what happened then was that the media took all this data and activists and others, they took this data and they started writing stories that said things like, local hospital, deadliest hospital in England, you know, and that kind of thing. And what happened was people became aware and they started thinking and looking up the data for their own hospitals. This caused, of course, an outrage because you don't want to be the dirtiest hospital, right? <laughs> so there was more incentive then and public pressure to really address the issue. What happened after that? The government then said, okay, you know what? This is an important issue. The public has spoken. The media is all over this issue. We need to do something about it. So what they said was then, okay, we're, we're going to be monitoring your data and your, um, and your results about hospital-acquired infections. And we're going to tie your funding, your public funding, to your performance on dealing with this issue. Uh, if you don't meet our standards, then your funding will be cut. But what they also did was then they put money into the problem and they said, we will give you money to develop infection control um, programs and things like that. And what you see here is the number of infections went down precipitously. From 2004, when you had, um, you know, when they started really introducing a target and when they enhanced the surveillance of the, by hospital of, of the infection control, you can see that the number went down significantly. And what this means, people didn't, Fewer people got sick, fewer people died. This is the power of open data. This is the power of what we can do as journalists. So, knowing that from the UK, I thought, okay, well, let's try to do this in Hong Kong. And so what I did was, I said, okay, well, I need to find out whether or not the government is even collecting information about hospital-acquired infections. So I went and I uh, wrote, a, uh, wrote a letter for um, asking um, the code on access to information making a code on access to information request and said, I would like to know the number of deaths by facility in this long letter right here. Um, now, Hong Kong does not have a Freedom of Information Act. We are not entitled to data. What we are able to do is we are able to request and the government has to respond and say, yes, we will give you the information or no, we won't give you the information. But, um, so I basically asked and I got put back and forth, back and forth, 
different departments were sending me to other departments. No one wanted to give the answer. And finally, I found out that the hospital authority, which is half government and half private, was the one that was collecting this data. And they had been collecting it for years, but they were not making it public. So then at that point, I said, OK, well, let's just go ask the hospital authority to give us this information. It's in the public interest. We have documented proof that this can save lives, right? Uh, they did not respond that well to that information, to that request. They basically said, we don't give that information out, sorry. Uh, you know, and when I said, why, why not? Why don't you make it public? They said, the data is not ready. So I don't know what that means because you know, data is pretty straightforward. You collect it and then you keep it. I don't know what they were, were waiting for it to do in terms of um, getting ready. <coughs> But what I decided to do was, you know, I could have made a choice. I could have said, okay, they won't give the information, so we'll let it go and just leave it. But what I thought was, okay, well, let's see what's out there on the internet. Um, you know, let's see whether there's information that has been put out there by these departments, and we can go from there. So what I did was I went to Google, and I looked up MRSA Hospital Acquired Infections, and I did site.gov.hk and file type PDF. This is, um, you know, if you, this is a useful tool regardless. Smart searching on Google is really fantastic because what it does is it allows you to look at and search through documents that may still be online but are not, you can't see from the website, you can't link to from the website, but it does give you a lot of information. So what I found was a PDF of a PowerPoint presentation that was called MRSA Workshop Local Epidemiology. And what it had was all kinds of information about the percentage of people who died when they caught uh, MRSA, the year, year, the number of cases, the number of infection rate. This is all information they said was not ready for public consumption, but yet it was on a PowerPoint in, um, on the internet. And so when I went back to the hospital authority and I said, well, you know, you guys have this information online and, uh, and I'm gonna publish it because it's online and it's from your website, uh, they said, well, that PowerPoint was not for you. That's for an academic audience. And my response is, well, then don't put it on the internet. It's just not a good idea. Um, but what, this ha what happened here was basically by saying, okay, you know, you have a choice. You guys will either, I'm either going to publish what I see here, or we can have a dialogue and talk more about what the data is, and we can actually you know, do an interview and really put some context behind this. Uh, and ultimately what they decided to do was they decided to let us, they gave us all the data and they were able to, um, and we had a great interview with the infection control officer and we were able to write the story. And now they continue to publish this data on a quarterly basis. So this is an example where I was not, as a journalist, I was not entitled to the data. They could have said, no, we're not going to give it to you and you'll never get it. But by being able to really tap into all of those fingerprints that are on the internet, uh, on the web, and getting some information, you could then begin to negotiate for, uh, for more information to be put out there. And, and that's what's happened. Another example um, was a case where we were talking about uh, traffic accidents in Hong Kong. Um, Hong Kong is quite crowded, and there are certain areas of Kowloon uh, that are just absolutely crazy. Buses are going all over the place, and people are walking on the streets, and you just you look at it and you're like, okay, this is just not safe. Um, and what happened was we said we wanted to really take a uh, look and record the number of people who were being injured in specific places, uh, in, in, um, particularly on one road that was infamous and notorious for being a place where there are lots of accidents. Uh, now, what happened in this case was you had a situation where you had an activist and people who were saying, we know that Nathan Road is dangerous. We just know it. Uh, but they didn't really have concrete numbers of the number of people who had been hurt or anything like that. And so you're, we had a situation where you had a source who was making uh, an assertion, but we, what would have been really much more powerful is if we had data to back it up. And so what we did is we first started and we looked at uh, the Hong Kong Monthly Digest of Statistics. Hong Kong loves to collect statistics and they love to publish them. And this is great. It's a really valuable tool because these reports offer you a window into what they collect. What they do often is they give you, um, they give you aggregate numbers. So they'll say, in all of Kowloon, you know, there were 5,000 traffic accidents. How do they get that number? Obviously, someone's counting and someone's keeping record of that, right? They could even, and in these reports, they'll even say, of the 5,000 accidents, you know, 
A hundred were during a rainstorm, and 20 were during a sunny day. And so you know that, obviously, they are collecting a lot of very detailed information about every single accident. And it's probably not just in a stack of paper, because whoever that poor person is who has to count would be really, really sad. So it's most likely stored in a database. Um, the other thing that we knew was they also published this, um, this list of what they called black sites, where people are, uh, where they would be able to say that there were six or more pedestrian injury accidents in one year, or nine or more injury accidents in the past year. And so this, what we knew here was that not only do they know where are the most dangerous places, they also know how many people are getting hurt. So again, this further reinforces the notion that they are collecting a lot of information. What they would not do was they would not give us the detailed information of every single accident and where they were happening so that we could actually do our own assessment and say, well, we hear that Nathan Road is very dangerous. Let's take a look at it. What happened was we made a request to the Department of Transportation. They said, no, we don't go that information. But just by chance, actually, I was talking to a friend of mine who worked at the University of Hong Kong, and I said, oh, I'm so annoyed. They won't give me this information. And he said, oh, really? They just gave me that information, like, last week. And so I said, wait, what? Why, are you, why did they give you the information? He said, oh, well, you know, we're going to do, we're gonna, you know, do some analysis and write some stories and put them on the internet. And so I went back to the uh, government officers and I said, you, you just gave this information to someone else, and to the University of Hong Kong. And they said, oh, uh, let me call you back. So call me back the day after, and they say, um, oh, well, we only gave it to them because they're using it for academic purposes. They're not going to put anything on the internet or make anything public. And I said, no, I know the person who's doing this, and he told you that they're going to put something on the internet. And he said, and this government officer said, uh, okay, let me call you back. <laughs> so, next day, they called me back and they said, okay, yes, we did get this information, and okay, we'll give it to you if you really want it. So, I said, okay, great, you know, give me exactly what you gave him. And they said, okay, that will be two weeks. Which is silly because obviously they gave, I mean, they already put the data together and gave it to this person, so why would it take so long? But it's fine, they gave it to us eventually, and what we were able to do is, this is what it looked like. The data, the data was in, um, they gave you the number of the accident, the severity, and all kinds of information about when it was, whether it was sunny or raining and all this other stuff. But look at the location data. Near lamppost BC0548, Tung Chung Road, New Territories. So these were not actual like addresses that you could easily plot on a map. These were basically just what the police wrote. So whatever was closest to that in their report that they could then put it. So this was not going to be very useful for our analysis because you can't measure things by, by, by address. You can't plot them on a map using this kind of information. So what we, what, we, we, what we were able to do is we took a trick and we said, we want to focus on Nathan Road. So using Excel and using one formula, we just said, give us every line that says Nathan somewhere in the address. Because our assumption is, if the accident was involved on Nathan Road, it would say Nathan somewhere in here. So what we did there was then we took that information, taking the list that they gave us was 15,000 accidents, and we were able to narrow it down to a few hundred. And then what we were able to do is, using that, we just dumped it right into Google Fusion tables, and then you were able to get this kind of nifty little map here that really documented all the places where there were accidents. Um, and then from that map, we were able to give that to the graphics guys, and they were able to do this really, really fantastic map here. Um, a few other cases, and I don't want to take too long here. Um, another case that we were able to do is, uh, we were able to do at South China Morning Post, was to track how Hong Kong and Chinese companies were being used by Iran to evade sanctions. Now this is something that we, had, we knew was happening and had been reported, but one of the questions that we had was, why is Hong Kong involved? Like why, you know, they, the uh, New York Times and the Wall Street Journal had published reports talking about the overall global scheme. And in, that st in their stories, they mentioned that there were you know, 20 ships that, or roughly 20 ships that had been, um, uh, had been, had been kind of um, owned by companies in Hong Kong. And so we thought, okay, well that's interesting. Why Hong Kong of all these places in the world? So we wanted to go and do some digging on that. And so what we're able to do is using a shipping database and then the Hong Kong Companies Registry, which I highly recommend, recommend you guys learn how to use because 
I guarantee you that there will be many Malaysian companies that are actually also registered in Hong Kong, um, whether they're offshore or whatever. It's very easy and very inexpensive to register a company in Hong Kong, and it's a good way to have an offshore entity um, if you're doing business. So the Hong Kong Companies Registry is great because it provides you with a ton of information. They give you all the annual reports and all these sorts of different things. And so what we were able to do was we looked at every ship that had its flat, a Hong Kong flag that used to be part of the Iran shipping lines. Then what we did was we looked at every Hong Kong company and downloaded all their details. And what we were able to find is that it was this huge web of connections. So here at the top of the, the ships here you, with a little red flag, those were Hong Kong ships. They were owned by Hong Kong companies. But these Hong Kong companies also owned or had mortgages on companies that were on ships that were shipped in, that were flagged in Malta. And so we thought, that's weird, why is that? And then you also see you have, um, we had more details because of these company documents about the mortgages, about all the different other entities that were involved in this as well, including the service providers. One of the things that we were most interested in was the mortgage detail. In previous stories that had been done about this network of companies, um, what they, there was only circumstantial evidence. They could say the company that um, owns that owns these ships uh, is technically a Hong Kong company, but its 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 actual address is registered in the same building in Tehran as the old Iran shipping lines. So it was all basically, I mean, you, you knew what they, could, what they were saying. They were saying that it was very, very, there was a lot of overlap. But there wasn't that silver bullet that said, you know, they are, that Iran shipping lines still owned these ships, right? All you could say was that they're still very, very close. What we were able to do through these company documents was bury pages into one of these documents. You saw um, the mortgage from one of the ships and said the borrower. And the borrower was the Islamic Republic of Iran shipping lines. So here you had a situation where you had unequivocal evidence on paper that was publicly available that proved that behind this whole network was actually the Iran shipping lines. And I'm going to actually skip through a few of these other things because we're running out of time. Um, one last point um, is one of the other things that we can do in these kinds of in stories is, you know, the challenge with reporting based on sources is that a lot of times if they're talking about something that's a little controversial or a little sensitive, sources don't want to use their names. They don't want to be named publicly, and that's always a challenge. And the problem with that is because if you don't name the source, uh, you are relying on their credibility. Uh, you are believing that whatever they say is true. This can be tricky and it can go both ways. Maybe it's a source that you really, really trust and they are giving you good information, but they're not putting their name out there. It's your name <coughs> on the story. Um, another situation is they may be somebody who has an agenda and because they're not putting their name out there, they can tell you anything. And ultimately, if it turns out that they're not right, you're the one who's gonna be the one who's gonna be in trouble, right? So when you're talking about stories that are very sensitive, that have to do with the reputation of companies or other people, you really want to make sure that to the best of your ability, you can back up whatever it is that you're reporting on with documents, with, um, with concrete information. And so here's, a, here's an example of a story that I actually did with one of my colleagues, um, which is called the Princeton of Private Equity. And it was basically about um, a, a private equity firm that was, um, was co-founded by Jiang Zemin's grandson. Jiang Zemin was the former president of China. Um, his grandson was uh, this guy who was in his 20s. Um, he graduated from Harvard and then went to work for Goldman for nine months and then suddenly became part of a private, private equity firm that was very, very, um, that was quite, got quite a bit of media press because of the other people who were involved, who were very noted deal makers in the private equity field. And so when the, when, when the publicity first came out about this private equity firm, um, all the attention was on all the other people who were co-founders of this firm. You know, Mary Ma, who was of Lenovo, and um, you know, uh, uh, Stephen Tong, who was a very noted deal maker who had been in private equity for a long time, and others. Um, and when people were asking about Alvin Jung, because obviously, you know, the grandson of a former president, everyone said, oh, he's a junior partner. He's not as, you know, he, he's, 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 you know, secondary to these big deal makers. And, oh, that's uh, Alvin Jung with his grandpa. Um, uh, but what we were able to do is by looking at the Hong Kong Companies Registry, what we were able to find 
was that he, in fact, was the founding director of the company. He was the person who signed the document that, um, you know, that really helped found this organization. So at the age of, you know, in his mid-20s, you know, fresh out of college, he was one of the co-founders of a very prominent private equity firm. Uh, another thing that we're able to do is, in terms of just trying to do all that due diligence, um, one thing I, that is a great resource is, um, you know, the Who Is database. This is the registration for domain names. So um, I looked up, just on a hunch, I looked up a bunch of different um, domain names. Now, boyucapital.com was not actually a website that you could actually visit, but I had a feeling, you know, it's the name of the company, let's see whether or not they had registered the domain name. And what you saw was, when you registered the domain name, if you, what that happens is unless you turn on a privacy setting, um, it actually publishes the personal details and information uh, of the person who registered. And in this case, you could see that he, uh, the name of the person who registered it was Alvin Jung, the registrant name, and then there was an address and a phone number and an email. So these are all very useful tools if you're trying to find. Um, and what this does is, it doesn't, you know, all it says is that he registered, or the domain name is registered in his name, right? But it, you know, then counters this argument that he is just, you know, a secondary junior guy, right? Because why would he be the one who would be registering the domain? Um, and lastly, one last point is the kind of the future and the frontier of data journalism, which is uh, how you communicate data in new ways. Um, a project that I was lucky enough to work on um, at Reuters was um, a project called Connect to China. And what we were trying to do was we were trying to find a way to explain how power flows in China from different organizations in the government, military, and party, how they all work together and how power flowed, and then also how people who were in, at the top levels of the power system of the party, how they were able to get up there, and who were the people who were, had supported them throughout their career. Basically, their social networks. And so what we were able to do with this team um, was to collect a lot of information about relationships between people, between organizations, and um, job histories between the organizations and um, uh, the job histories of these top leaders. And we put them into a database, and then we worked with a really fantastic data visualization firm called Fathom Information Design, and they built an iPad app uh, that, it was, that, that really helped to communicate that information. And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to press by a database, we can keep it updated um, in real time and push it to, to the web. Anyway, so thanks very much. I also noticed that, you know, we, uh, even without Freedom of Information Act, there are so many ways to circumvent uh, the of restrictions and to be able to gather data. And uh, finally, uh, we'll have Professor Zaharu Nai, who uh, uh, needs no introduction actually in the media uh, landscape, uh, who happens to be also my lecturer. I'm proud to have him uh, next to me now. And uh, he's currently Professor of Media and Communication Studies at the University of Nottingham, Malaysia campus has published a volume on political cultural developments in Malaysia, titled Rhetorics and Realities. Uh, he's currently editing a volume on civil society and the new media in six Southeast Asian countries, <coughs> uh, funded by IDRC Canada. It's an international project which he's, uh, he hated. He's also completing uh, several volumes on politics, and uh, it's a single authored volume on politics and the media in Malaysia, which is due for publication end of this year. He's also an advisor for Center for Independent Journalism and many more. I think you can interview him to know further. Uh, he'll be speaking on uh, data-driven Malaysian journalism, some thought on access and validity. Where perhaps he can bring in some understanding about even ethical considerations in relation to uh, pursuing big data. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I wish to thank the organizers of uh, this forum, uh, more specifically Taylor School of Communications and Ms. Carla Guilty for inviting me to be part of this illustrious panel uh, and to speak on this topic of data and journalism. It is always good to be in Taylor's, especially since my personal and professional links with the school go back quite a long way to when it was initially offering a diploma and degree program with my former employers up north in Penang, University of Science Malaysia. When I received the invitation uh, 
to this forum, the intro to the invitation read, Big data in journalism can be a means to insightful, intelligent, and freer news reporting, and thus promoting active citizenry. I recall smiling cynically when I read that, and soon after the smile turned into a frown, especially when I thought about the current state of journalism in Malaysia. So let me begin with a couple of caveats. First, much if not all of what I will be talking about today is specifically related to Malaysian journalism, which in many ways I believe is fast decaying. Uh, second, I have no objections whatsoever to the use of data uh, in any endeavor. I would say that data is crucial in backing and strengthening arguments, not only in journalism, but also in so many different fields. Indeed, my quarrel isn't with data, big or small, but more with the issues surrounding the data, including the environment within which the data is gathered and processed, and who exactly are providing the data. It would seem that the term big data is becoming the rage, as it were, in this age of what Dan Schiller, among others, has called the age of digital capitalism. As with many of these fashionable trends, there is a tendency for different societies, different economies, different political formations to embrace it, making the phenomenon snowball, possibly worldwide. In a recent document from the office of the U US president titled Big Data, Seizing Opportunities, Preserving Values, the authors provide numerous definitions of big data, but I guess the one that closely matches what has so far been talked about today is, and I quote, large, diverse, complex, longitudinal, and or distributed data sets generated from instruments, sensors, internet transactions, email, video, click streams, and or all other digital sources available today and in the future. What apparently is significantly different about big data is encapsulated in the three Vs, volume, variety, and velocity. As the authors of the recent US report put it, it is data that is so large in volume, so diverse in variety, or moving with such velocity that traditional modes of data capture and analysis are insufficient. So we are supposed to imagine a world that has immense information flowing, circulating, crossing boundaries even, information that has vast potential to change the world as we know it, to transform society as it were, to borrow from our delightful, albeit rather muted these days, Prime Minister Najib. Reading parts of this document from the US President's office, one can help one can help having a sense of deja vu. For me, at least, it transported me back to the promises brought about after the Second World War in the 1950s and 1960s. It was the period of rebuilding and decolonization, and the media, especially television, were being touted as the magic wand that was going to help to transform societies all over the world, to liberate them politically, culturally, economically, thus modernizing the wretched of the earth. Then, as now it would seem, there was an inability, latent disregard, some might say, to look at context. Indeed, what seemed like unnecessary haste to introduce this then new technology to the developing colonies, much of the control of the technology invariably fell into the hands of the state or governments, who many naturally and naively assumed would use this technology for the benefit of their peoples. <coughs> But as many of us know now, not many governments or states are automatically, naturally benign. But the damage had already been done by the, same, by the, by the time many really realized this. And the, and the technology then was used to control people rather than liberate them. And it is this reflection on the role of media in Malaysia over the past half century or so that makes me rather cautious and restrained about this thing called big data, and more specifically the implicit promise of data-driven journalism in Malaysia, which brings me back to the word context. And what is the context within which Malaysian journalists and Malaysian journalism operate? It is an extremely close, restricted context, I would argue. It is a context where instead of a Freedom of Information Act, we have the opposite, the Official Secrets Act the 1972 Official Secrets Act. It is an act that state 
that states, among others, that an official secret is any document specified in the schedule and any information material relating thereto and includes any other official document, information and material as may be classified as top secret, secret, confidential or restricted as the case may be by a minister, the Minister Basar or Chief Minister of a state or such public officer. That one restriction alone constrains anybody's ability to get relevant data, to get information. I came across this restriction myself during the course of conducting research just a couple of years ago on the TV audience demographics in Sabah and Sarawak. The authority concerned politely refused to give me the information as it was then deemed sensitive. The next problem, of course, is even when you or journalists get hold of such information, how valid are they? Ideally, there would be a number of different sources, hence allowing you to compare data. But we don't live in an ideal world where time is not of the essence, where checks and comparison may be made with legitimate sources. One good example of this is the figures of the success of Malaysia's new economic policy just a few years back. An independent think tank had then declared that the 30% quota of the Malaysian economy for Bumi Trust had already been achieved. And immediately the regime came up with alternative figures to indicate the opposite. And more often than not, there is a reluctance, if not an outright refusal, by state agencies to reveal the methodology involved in gathering and processing the data. The, the, the Official Secrets Act, not, Act notwithstanding, there is a slew of other non-democratic laws that curtail free access to relevant data in Malaysia. Again, not so long ago, there was a lot of discussion about the rise of crime rates in major cities in Malaysia. In response, the then Home Minister categorically denied that crime was increasing. This was followed by the police releasing so-called data on crime rates that indicated clearly, surprise, surprise, that crime rates have fallen. That the police force's key performances index, KPIs, had already been met and met very successfully in that. It also led to the minister saying it was only the people's perception that crime was on the increase. And what did the journalists, particularly the mainstream journalists in the print media and broadcasting do about this? Absolutely nothing. In this regard, I think most, if not all of us, are familiar with the saying, garbage in, garbage out. So we have legal constraints and political constraints. Then also we have commercial constraints. Data that's compiled and organized by commercial entities can be quite costly to purchase. Major news organizations may have deep pockets that enable the journalists to get such information. But it would be rather difficult, if not financially impossible, for net-based organizations such as Malaysia Kini to do so. We also need to remember that many big conglomerates in Malaysia are what are called GLCs or government link companies <clears throat> who are not about to allow themselves to be scrutinized and have the regime to back them. Recent examples include the Malaysian car maker Proton. <clears throat> Despite the fact that it is now owned by Saq Mokhtar Al Bukhari's DRB Highcom, it is still the BN government making statements on the company's behalf with very little follow up by the media. The recent debacle surrounding Saq Mokhtar's Al Bukhari University, which closed down, leaving 600 students having to be sent elsewhere, and the Ministry of Education releasing statements on the university's behalf is yet another example of this very close, secretive, and restrictive environment within which journalism, let alone data journalism, operates. Then, of course, to conclude this data less presentation, there is the problem of the journalists themselves. Here I'm talking about the large majority of mainstream media personnel. As I've said many, many times before, undemocratic, undemocratic laws such as the Printing Presses and Publications Act and the Malaysian Communications and Multimedia Commission Act, together with so many others, including acts that curtail the activities of students in universities, all contribute towards cultivating a very docile, obedient media fraternity. The recent coverage 
of the tragic MH370 flight for the last princess. These laws imposed a fear often unfounded that there might be freedom of speech in Malaysia, but there could be no freedom of speech after speech. Hence, in this environment, in this context, what has really developed over the decades is what has really developed over the decades is a fraternity of transcribers, a fraternity of stenographers who nonetheless prefer to call themselves journalists. It is in this bigger Malaysian context of control, socialization, and resulting docility, I'm afraid that we have to locate the potential of big data and the possibility, however remote it might seem at the moment, of data journalism. Okay, so as not to disappoint everyone, to end this presentation, here are a couple of data sets to chew on. First, Malaysia's free of the press ranking over the past 20 years. As you can see, we've been quite consistently lying in the 60s region, where one indicates the greatest press freedom that can be achieved, and 100 indicates the, less, the least or no press freedom. And here's another one about, from Freedom House indicating where we stand in comparison with other countries. If anything, this ranking of 141, which really puts us in the region just above and freer than the likes of Singapore, Brunei, Vietnam, and Cambodia, doesn't say anything good about the Prime Minister's post some time ago about being the best democracy. <laughs> As we would say in Malay, Chakap Tatsrubam Kid. Thank you. Have some, uh, we have just had some understanding about uh, freedom of the press and how it can also be <coughs> uh, a hindrance if uh, not much of freedom is given to the press to express themselves or even the data that they have uh, uh, generated. Um, I would like to uh, open uh, now uh, to the floor for anyone to ask any relevant questions to our panelists here who have, uh, uh, I think, uh, vast amount of information to, uh, to share with you. Just mention a name and you can ask uh, the question. Yeah? Anyone? And she's working with Roger Brightness with um, information about China and stuff like that. So if you know China is a pretty close um, control uh, market or country, therefore, we, uh, for, for example, like, uh, I want to search news on China. So we will have the mainstream news, which is like um, the big news we call it, but if you were to have like local news and you would like to find local information, it's quite restricted. So I would like to know how, um, what problems she faced when she actually tried to get information and data of it because China is so, and of course it's in Chinese, so Google Translate helped a lot, but sometimes I do face the problem where I would like to know how she actually overcome it, what, um, maybe what website or what, um, what website that is accessible by everybody in Malaysia so that we can know more because uh, China is a very uh, fast developing country, everybody want a job there so yeah, so we would like to know how to actually um, go through going to the market in China. Thank you. It's, very, it's a very good question. Uh, for the investigations that I have done uh, related to China, um, I, I'm going to admit that I, I don't read Chinese. I can speak conversationally, but um, I definitely can't, I'm not at a level where I could, um, you know, read corporate documents or anything like that. Um, in terms of my investigations, um, I principally relied on information that is stored outside of China. So for example, the Hong Kong Companies Registry um, or other sources online. Um, when, when, it, when using, I mean, Google Translate is not sufficient. Um, to translate Chinese documents. So I work with other reporters who do have the Chinese language um, to, to get information. Um, one of the things that we've seen in the past couple of years is that there are increase, an increasing number of um, investigative reports uh, that have been done by the New York Times, by Bloomberg, uh, by the Wall Street Journal about various top officials in China and their families and, and kind of the companies and the wealth that they've accumulated. Um, that was actually a perfect example of using document-based reporting for sensitive subjects. 
um, it would not, they would not have been able to write those stories if they said, you know, you know, Xi Jinping's family own, you know, has accumulated millions of dollars of wealth according to five sources, right? So what they were able to do is they actually went and through attorneys requested company documents that were um, stored by the Chinese government um, as well as using Hong Kong company registry and other documents. And I think that that's one, um, that's, that's an exciting, it's an exciting time for us, and I think that only with that, those documents and, and that kind of information were they actually able to report those stories um, and feel confident about that. Um, you know, you'd be surprised how interconnected um, the world is now. And as I mentioned, I think that you'd probably be surprised to see how many um, Malaysian companies either have joint ventures in China or are have have um, offshore entities registered in. British Virgin Islands, Hong Kong, Singapore, other places. And so I think that one of the keys uh, to being able to do this kind of work is to not only know what's happening locally, but also to be able to access the resources in, in, in other countries. Um, many of the things that we're talking about are actually available online. I have two questions. So the first question is, um, in listening to Irene's presentation, and it is quite interesting about how in Hong Kong it is possible to get around the lack of a Freedom of Information Act. But I feel, I don't know whether this is true, um, I do feel that also was facilitated by the authorities' own willingness to at least once you press, you pin them against a wall to stay accountable to what kind of information that they are able to um, share. So the, my question following that, I suppose, is more to the Malaysian panelists. How do you feel on our side of the pond about that sort of like um, ease of doing business as work? Because that's actually still basic journalism. It, you know, that's basic journalism as it were, but you still need authorities to kind of like play their part and be willing to step up. Second is uh, to Kamal's um, poly tweet. What's interesting about the the verification and the identification, the effort that you have done, to me it sounds you do need to at this point still commit a lot of manual labor, a lot of human resources into it. Um, my question is moving forward, specifically for your organization, but probably for other um, social media platform analysis outfits that you know of. Um, what's the what's the what's What's the level of automated processes that you could introduce in the content analysis of the material that you obtain? Uh, I ask because there's a lot of social science scientists who do a lot of content analysis as well, a lot of qualitative research, and they do at least automate a part of that. And I'm not sure whether there is any kind of like Share, sharing in terms of these are the available tools, or maybe they need different tools, so I'm just curious. Yeah. So I'll take the first question. Um, you bring up a very good point, and it's something that I often emphasize with my students, is what I'm talking about here is basic journalism, not giving up when someone says no the first time, um, if they don't respond to your phone call, going to their office and asking questions. Um, and you're right, in the stories, that, the examples I gave, eventually the government basically said, okay, we'll give you what you're asking for. Um, and I think that it's going to be different in different places. I understand that Malaysia can be a tricky place in terms of um, you know, a challenging media environment. And so I think that my point in this is that um, one, that there is a lot out there, and you know, in the case of the, uh, the hospital acquired infections situation, if they didn't give me the information in the complete way, in the perfect way that I wanted it, I would have still written a story about based on that document. Um, and I think that what the point is, and I think it would have been fair, because we knew where the source was, we knew that it was accurate, uh, you know, that, 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 that information came, it wasn't just fraudulent information, that it was from a good source. Um, and you know, there is no media paradise anywhere in the world, okay? No matter where you are, it's gonna be very hard to do what we do. Um, the key is to, you know, sometimes if we don't get 100% perfect information, we report about 
the 70% of information that we do have, but we make a point in our story to say, this is only part of the story, we asked for the whole information, but the government wouldn't give it to us. And you just have to be honest with the, you know, your readers and your audience as well. Um, you do have to make a decision whether you think it's responsible to report. And that's something that you know, comes with experience and good mentors and good editors. Uh, but I think that you know, the point is that, yeah, sometimes they're not gonna, they're gonna say, you know what, no, we're not gonna give you this information. Uh, sometimes they'll lie to you. Uh, that's why it's very important whenever you have these conversations with public officials to, if it's a spokesperson or an information officer, get their name, get their phone number, and be very clear with them and just say, if they start being difficult, you say, from this moment on, just so we're clear, this is on the record and I will quote you. If you say, if you make an assertion and you say, we don't have this information, but I know that you do, then I'm going to say, the government said, we do not have this information and then, but, you know, X newspaper discovered, whatever, whatever, whatever. It's not perfect, but you, we do what we can. Um, and I think that what you find is that every time you make a request, I would say half the time, the reason why you say, someone says no is because they don't know where to find the information. They're tired that they, they didn't get to eat lunch, and so they don't feel like helping you out. Uh, or, you know, they, they feel they're not confident because they don't know, and they don't know who to ask, and it's, it would be really troublesome for them to, to, to follow up. It's easier for them to say no. Uh, but, you know, if you keep pushing, I mean, for the, for the uh, hospital acquired Superbug story, I called them and spoke to them for a half hour every single day for three weeks. Like, just having the same conversation over and over and over again. And sometimes it's just, you have to do it. Uh, if, in, you know, you hope that your editors will give you the time. But, um, you know, sometimes it's worth it, it pays off in the long term. Um. On, on freedom of information laws, we should actually remember in Slango and Penang, we do have state level enactments. But I'm not sure how many people have actually used that, as, that access. Uh, people should try. I mean, you know, hold the state government responsible in, in the event they do not actually allow you the access. Another, another avenue for official information is parliamentary questions. Your, no matter, you know, uh, uh, despite the imperfections of our system, uh, parliamentarians can still ask questions and get some substantial answer. For example, uh, going back to GE 13, uh, the whole questions of indeliberate aim for voting, how do we know at the end it was actually not indeliberate but edible? They actually use food colouring. It's actually true parliamentary questions. Because it come, you can't lie all the time. It comes to a point someone will just give you the answer, either because that they feel that it's not in their interest to lie, or they didn't realize revealing all those information would be damaging to their political master. And you can use it, and parliament would have three sessions a year. You can actually talk to your MP. Many of them don't have questions to ask. I think they can submit 10 questions. So you can, you can actually plan out when you want it and throw this in. And same go for your state assembly. So I think it is a question of how do you push. Thanks. Okay, I've never formally asked for any data, so I don't have much in any experience with the FYI Act or anything. But uh, one difference I found with the Slango state enactment was that if the government collects data, you are entitled to ask for it. And they have also had all kinds of conditions to allow them to block you. Say, for example, in one uh, suburb that I know of, there was a town hall that was supposed to be built on the land by the developer, but the details could not be disclosed to the residents' association because it involved the developer. So you know the government signed its, its party to that contract. The developer has to approve to disclose that contract before you're allowed to have it, even with the FOI Act. So there's a certain weakness there. So uh, coming to that automated uh, sum summation of, uh, of data, I'm, manual reading still seems to be the best way because the problem with Twitter is, especially during a rally, there's no network. So you end up sending tweets much later on. So to be 100% sure, it's best to summarize and then still 
go back and read everything in order. And uh, one thing I'm looking at is expanding on that word cloud. So say at 3 o'clock, these are the popular words, and at 4 o'clock suddenly a new word comes in. So what is that new word? So it could be Pulapol, where people are being detained. So that's one concept that I'm looking into to help speed up analysis. Yeah. Um, I agree totally with Irene that it's actually basic journalism uh, asking the questions. Unfortunately, I would say in the context of Malaysia, uh, since the 1980s, because the media and other institutions in Malaysia have been, have been under a lot of us, uh, tremendous assault by the Mahathir regime at that point in time. Uh, I think quite a lot of journalists over the period of time have become very tame, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, the good thing, the positive thing I see here is uh, the emergence of the internet, the emergence of internet websites. Yeah. Uh, and I think a lot of the younger people here who, who, who tend to use the internet and, and, and want information, I think there is greater possibility now uh, than there was before. Right? Uh, so while my presentation might have been pretty pessimistic, nonetheless, I think there is hope. Uh, and uh, what Chin Huat said about the ways and means of asking questions uh, and where to ask those questions, I think that's very important as well. Yeah. Unfortunately, like I said, because many journalists have become so used to not asking critical questions, that they've been socialized to doing that, there is a need to relearn their craft, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and I think that that is possible. But you also asked about collaboration, is it, with researchers? Uh, I was just wondering, I mean, going back to alternative sum summary as Babam described it, it's essentially content analysis. And as far as I know, social scientists are doing content analysis as well, you know, of, of books, literature, um, social media conversations, just conversations online, and a lot of the a lot of them now do use automated uh, processes for that because tools are available. So I was wondering how much to that extent is that being made aware of or is it because it's a different requirement altogether that's why the tools are not used? Uh, we at Nottingham, uh, my colleague, especially Tessa Houghton, who did the major study on the co uh, election coverage by the media, uh, are very aware of PolyTweet and she's been uh, in touch uh, with PolyTweet. I think, but not very rarely. <laughs> so uh, we, we, we will be following that up at some point in time because uh, we value the work done there, uh, the stuff on, on content analysis. Uh, so we, we are in the process of working together in, in many ways. Um, oh, sorry. I was just going to say that there are a few applications. I mean, this is what you're talking about, sentiment analysis, content analysis. Not only academics are doing this, businesses are trying to make lots of money by tuning algorithms to, to figure that out. Because if you, let's say you are in the business of providing business data, such as Thomson Reuters, um, if you can use social media to give your uh, subscribers an edge in terms of something that's happening, that's obviously very advantageous. Um, you know, it's still a lot in development. One interesting, um, New, uh, new kind of outfit called is called Storyful in terms of an application to, to journalism, and um, what they have said is that they have an algorithm as well as you know individual researchers who who can help to use social media to verify news events basically to say you know we're getting reports that there was a protest in this city um, we can they ha they say they have a proprietary algorithm that can use social media to give a clue as to whether or not that's true or not, and then they have individual reporters and researchers who then go comb through the details and do the manual work to see if they can actually verify it or, um, or, or discredit whatever report there is. So, you know, journalism is definitely interested in this, um, and I think that you're gonna see more and more of that coming out in, in the coming years. Thank you. They say journalism is a first draft of history. I think in that sense, content analysis may be quite useful uh, may not so much be journalism, but if, you, if you're interested to reconstruct social history, uh, I think that's probably the way, because you do have rich data. Uh, for, for example, we do not have political opinion data, uh, you know, I suppose before 2000s. So very rarely you have them, you can't make a comparison over the year, but newspapers are always available. Uh, 
the, the shortcoming of that is that it, it's exhausting. <laughs> I had a project of 2008. I managed to get most of the election reports uh, across four languages coded. Uh, but then, you know, to clean up, to make comparison is again another thing. And, and it ended up in history. Not so much of journalism. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Yes, please. Hi, um, my name is Rachidi. First and foremost, um, congratulations to Josephine from Taylor's School of Communication for organizing this event. And also me from MDEC, who has been very proactive in this Big Data Week, and Sandra also from Big Data Organization. Um, I'm going to take this a notch a little bit. Um, I don't know whether this forum is appropriate with young minds, but let's, let's take this a notch, for example. I practiced law for 15 years, um, and then I went to technology. I was in China for five years. I was based in Fenghua, which is about one and a half hours away from Shanghai. So I pretty much understand where you guys are coming from. My, I have questions for all of you. You guys, give me 10 minutes. All right? First and foremost, uh, yeah, uh, I like PolyTweet. Uh, basically, I do, I do use PolyTweet uh, as part of my uh, research. Uh, but I believe uh, Twitter in this country uh, is not reflective of the entire social media landscape. The Facebook account in Malaysia is 17.4 million, as opposed to Twitter account, which is 6 million. The number one Twitter account in this country is Najib Raza at 1.9 million. Number two is I think some Malaysian artists, my name is Diana Jasmine, Nora Danish, I don't know who they, who's half of them, I don't know. But number 10 is this Twitter account by the name of Kuching Gebu. 489,000. Interest, interestingly, Dr. Wong, in the top 10 in the country, Anwar Ibrahim is number 11. <laughs> interestingly. Um, so my question to you first, uh, Chairman, and then we shall move on to every one of you, is that why aren't you looking at Facebook to look at this kind of data and sentiments? That's my first question. Hi, uh, thank you for that. Uh, the difference is your Facebook post, even if you send it to public, I don't have the right to copy and paste and share it around. So, and the other reason is also for Facebook, the data collection is limited only to public posts. I only get a small glimpse into what is actually being said in private. Even though yeah, there are millions of Facebook accounts, it's, it's not a good picture, but eventually I will get to it. Uh, during AMNO's Rimpunan Agong last year, I collected all the mentions of AMNO every day. And it only came to about 2,000 plus posts a day, which is a lot. It's not really believable that there's definitely a lot more people talking about that. And I saw not much use back then just to collect data and keep quiet about it. Yeah, so for now, just sticking to Twitter. But you're right in the sense that it will, actually it will never reflect the whole country's opinion. It's more about the urbanites. And even then, I'm expecting like half of it to be chaos, like, no? same as Facebook. Facebook is also restricted in that sense. Yeah. Uh, which brings my questions to Dr. Wong. Um, I, you are a contributor to Malaysian Insider. Um, my last search of your name in Malaysian Insider comes from 291 results. Your last post was, I think, a couple of days ago, Hudud in 1946. It's an interesting post. I like that post, Dr. Wong. And in fact, it was uh, there was 10 tweets on that, apparently, of your Hudud and 1946 article, as of 4.30 today. All right, that is the power of internet. Anyway, my question to you is this, and this is relevant to also Ahmad's answer just now. Now, Malaysian Insider, whether you believe it or not, Chiamat, is actually the, uh, the reference point, besides Malaysia Kini, for hungry Malaysians looking for alternative information. If we are looking at Media Prima, uh, TV3, or Utusan Malaysia, we can brand them as the mouthpiece of Barisan National. 
aesthetic. We like to put it that way. So, and it, for the last many, many years, you know, anything that's printed by Maritime National, you know, that's the mouthpiece of the government, fine. Malaysian Insider, interestingly, do actually swing public opinion. I don't know whether you know that, Dr. Wong. And this is privilege. I will just take a, a recent example, the passing away of Karpal Singh. And because this is quite a new, a new um, uh, topic to be discussed. Now, hours after pass, uh, the day after Karpal Singh uh, passed away, there was an article in Malaysian Insider which stipulates this very clearly. This is what, I cannot remember who the, 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 the contributor was, but Malaysian Insider wrote this. Hours after the passing of Karpal Singh, hours after, let me underline that, all right? The Majlis Fatwa issued a fatwa that you cannot actually greet your fellow non-Muslim rest in peace. Interesting, then, because half of the country, all my friends, government or non-government, or Pakatan or not, went on the funeral to attack Majlis Fatwa. Now, interestingly, interestingly, somebody pointed out that actually, it wasn't even a fatwa by the National Fatwa Council. It, it came up from a block, a December 2013 block. All right. By whom? Um, I will refer to the article because I do have that. Okay, I do have that. I think, I think uh, Zainal Vijal from Majlis Pertuan uh, Muslim Malaysia pointed it out. And then a lawyer by the name of Lokman Sharif Alias from one of the busy, uh, leading law firms also pointed it out. All right. Now, to me, and this is also will go to you, so I think it's about journalism and also for you, Prof. It's about the integrity of journalism and how do you paint the picture. Now, when you, when you post this statement, hours after the passing of, as opposed to, I think the right way to post it would be, you know, somehow or rather, there was an article six months ago, you are actually, to be honest, Malaysian Insider actually, to be honest, is trying to uh, take advantage of the sentiments which was very high at that point of time, the passing away of Karpal Singh. Now, between Dr. Wong and Prof, just a little comment. Thank you very much. Now, I don't know the detail, thanks for pointing that. Uh, but I think regardless of whatever cases, uh, right of reply should be a necessity. You know, people should actually go back to verify and say whether this is and so on. And um, <coughs> of all online media, I would really point to another one that I contribute regularly, the net graph. The net graph actually make it a point that everything you cite, you know, they would, even as a writer, they would require me to give the pointer, uh, the source, so that people can actually go back and verify it. I think this is actually uh, a trend in journalism because in the past we thought about objectivity, but really, I mean, today, I think few people would think that you can be objective in news. But what is important is that people are transparent. You know, you review what your view is and for people to verify those informations and so on. Thanks. Uh, I read the, the comment the, about the uh, Makaba's death and the fatwa, the so-called fatwa. I also read that it wasn't a fatwa and it had been released earlier. My thoughts on that is that uh, TMI should have uh, come up with the correction yeah, uh, and, and stated clearly. Uh, so that's, that's, those are my thoughts on that. And clearly that they ought to be to have done that. Although I would say in the overall scheme of things, the stuff done by the other side, so to speak, Utusan, yeah, uh, the New Straits Times, uh, are much worse, if not as bad as. Right? So, but that's not to excuse what was done. It, the problem is a problem of ethics here, I think, and I think uh, this has been discussed quite a lot very recently about the lack of ethics among Malaysian journalists and the need for uh, a code of ethics. Unfortunately, we live in a country that does not much have that does not have much ethics. So, <laughs> if the people up there are not unethical, unfortunately, you're not going to get ethical journalists. I believe the environment again. Yeah. The other one about the swing in, both the, in uh, public opinion, you state there is, you, you said that there is a swing. What sort of evidence have you got to say that there is a swing in public opinion? I mean, uh, I don't, uh, you, you know, you, you say that TMI is, uh, is, 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 is the, the, the paper, so to speak, for disgruntled Malaysians, yeah, but disgruntled urban Malaysians perhaps, uh, you know, because I don't think that TMI or Malaysia Kini reach far out to the Malay heartland, so to speak. That's Utusan land, 
that is TV3 led. So I think we have to be careful about saying things like there is swing and when, when there is no evidence as far as I know to, to, to show that there has been the swing. And also we have to be careful about saying that they represent majority Malaysians in that sense. Yeah? Given, again, the, the lack of uh, penetration in, in certain areas, Sabah Sarawak for example, uh, by the internet media. Prof uh, caution about making generalization has an important point on the use of language. To use example used by uh, Sarah Kamal, uh, the, the word crowd is you show, right? You notice that the word police, both the Malay English version appear, the Pakatan, the English police is larger than the Malay one. But the Malay, the ordinary people, the one that include everyone, is the Malay, Malay word police, P-O-L-I-S, that's larger than P-O-L-I-S, L-I-C. Yeah, so there's, there's quite a bit of things that you actually find uh, that come down to the language. One issue, I mean, this we go beyond data journalism, but uh, just still a bit of that, is that we actually have language-specific censorship in Malay. That's, that's the real trouble. Because you have books that uh, you can get them legally, uh, for example, Charles Darwin's The Origin of Species, but the Indonesian version has been banned in this country since 2006. I mean, you can then go ahead with, uh, you know, with all the bans of Allah's and other words, but what we are talking about here uh, is, is, is that kind of uh, language-specific control. And in coming back to big data journalism, I think we need to be conscious of uh, multilingualism in this country, so that we would not just capture the English-speaking Malaysia. Now, if you have access to Malaysian Insider, uh, you have access, and I do not think you do, but if you do, you know, anybody in Malaysian Insider, look at the posting of that particular posting of Karpal Singh, the passing Karpal Singh. You will realize the reach. Now, Facebook has done very well for all of us. You will be able to tell you the reach of the posting. Where does the posting goes, to be honest? And, and, and yes, I do agree with you up to a certain extent the fact that Heartland and Malaysia are not, uh, what shall we say, exposed to this. But let me put this a fact, this is a fact of how this will affect the next general election, to be honest. Now, we know for a fact that most working Malaysians are city center urban, hence the Twitter and the Facebook account. Um, let me show you another statistics. 50% of Malaysians are below 30 years old. The average age of Malaysians is during 7.4 years age of age. The, the smartphone penetration rate in this country is almost 70%. MCMC will let you believe it's about 65%. Um, that's over around 60%. Meaning that, meaning that, Prof, half of the country, which is below 30, to be honest, we are a young country, below 30, we are all wired up. We are all wired up. And information today is easily available to all these young minds as we speak, to be honest. And Malaysian Insider is one of not the many, like the Nat Graf and the Fittings, if that free Malaysian to the FMZ and a few other things, are reference point. Why? Because the young minds does not believe anymore in Lutusan Malaysia. They do, they do not buy the paper. They don't buy Brita Haryan. Any one of you buy NST? <laughs> exactly. Now, that will spell the death of printed print newspaper, hence, you guys cannot find job in NST anymore after this. All right? But my point is this. They are not buying NST. They are not buying Bita Harian. They are not buying Utusan. But where are they getting the information? Take your pick. Take your pick. You know? So, a comment on that would be prompt. You can ask Mission Insider. You'll be surprised of the reach of that particular posting. Which goes to the next point. I mean, I was in China for five years, and we went through a lot of stuff trying to try because we set up companies in China and to get information like some of you pointed out was very difficult. Uh, we even deal with fictitious uh, government agencies, which impose with fictitious tax. To be honest, you know, and this is. But your stories has always been focused in Hong Kong. If I'm, not, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm, I'm quite excited about the, the, 
the Iran and the oil tankers, because that was my background, the oil and gas industry, and we actually know the transactions that goes to Iran as a, and Hong Kong as the tax heaven or the, the financial heaven. But do you also know, Irene, the fact that most, most factories in China are also setting up accounts in HSBC Naden Road, uh, which is, you reported, is about accidents there. If you do a little bit of checking in the HSBC's accounts, you'll find a lot of these Chinese companies, mainland China, setting up uh, accounts in Hong Kong. The reason being is that because in China, the financial instruments are not in place. For example, you cannot issue a uh, uh, bank guarantee, you know, SLDLC, to do trade. So most of them come over to Hong Kong to create companies to do these transitions. Hence, perhaps in a peaceful South China morning. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, quick response. Uh, two things. First one, about uh, the impact, so to speak, of the Malaysian insider's story on, on, uh, on the so-called fatwa. Unless you actually, or we actually do an audience study to see that there has been a swing, I don't know how you can assume that there has been a swing. You, have, you swing from one to the other, so to speak, right? So one would have to know what was the previous stand and what's the new stand. And was it really that particular incident or that particular report that resulted in the swing? Now, look, much earlier, earlier, and even now, effects studies on the research in media tend to be problematic because they isolate media and audience from a wider context. Yeah? There, are other, there are other factors, I think, that, one, that, that we have to look at. Second, uh, you point out to the young ones here and say they are going to change. Uh, uh, they are going to change um, the whole situation, the possibilities, because they are going to be 50% plus of them uh, in the year 2014. 2018. 2018. Yeah. I would like to be as optimistic as you about that, but how representative are the young ones here of the young ones in Malaysia? One. Secondly, even if they are convinced, and I hope they are convinced that a change is needed, uh, nonetheless, going back to uh, Dr. Wong's presentation about delineation, about this, uh, yeah, uh, all those kind of things, perhaps it doesn't really matter if there are critical comments about the government and all the scandals, if they can cheat that way, which they have done so far, and I think they will continue if we don't say something about it, uh, you know, they'll still win. I mean, the, the last elections, 52% of the popular votes went against them. Nonetheless, you look at the seats in parliament now, right? So, yes, the media, I think one has to understand the limitations of the media, so to speak, whether it's new media, whether it's social media, whether it's the press and broadcasting. Uh, we are, there are other factors at hand here that uh, I think need to also be taken into account in relation to the performance of the media. Okay. In relation to, uh, I just asked one question, in relation to uh, big data and uh, getting information like from Twitter, Facebook, what about privacy and law and uh, of the users and privacy rights? And that concern, do you take that into consideration when obtaining data? Yeah, I, I do have to take that into consideration because under both, I mean, the general rule is it's okay for you to collect data for yourself, but if you want to share it with others, then you have to deal with both Facebook and Twitter's uh, privacy rules. So for Twitter, any anything that you share publicly can be rebroadcast. You have, you, you know, if someone comes to the website and you have a problem with a tweet being there, I can ignore them. But our politeness, if they do ask for something to be taken down, then I will take it down. But with Twitter, they, they don't have the right to demand. But with Facebook, they do. And Facebook themselves might come after, after me if I started embedding Facebook posts in the website, even if it's public. It's, it's a bit confusing that, but you know, I just have to follow their terms and conditions. Or a straight road to pursue uh, such uh, avenues in social media. Yeah. <coughs> to follow up, so let's say if I'm, I'm writing an 
academic paper, and I make citations of a fa Facebook post, what should I do? Should I make it less generalized, or you know, so that I wouldn't infringe their privacy rule? But how do I cite them? Because I can't cite them. I think ideally you get their permission. If you're writing an academic piece, I mean, I cite your post as a, as a resource. Yeah. Otherwise, you have to anonymize it. I think, yeah, this is... uh, one more thing, uh, I'll go to the next question. Uh. Uh, data can be expensive and, uh, you know, extensive and expensive, but at the same time, when I ask my students in my classes if they want to read news online, do they mind subscribing? They would always say, prefer it to be free. One set, it is expensive to obtain data, data sets. On the other hand, you have to offer your work uh, for free as well, because even online community, uh, they have actually mentioned, you know, the studies have shown that they prefer it, uh, information to be free, especially from news media. Uh, how, how can anyone take this? News should be free. <laughs> it should, it's an incredible, I mean, I think that in as news organizations, this is just my opinion, this is not, I'm not representing Thomson Reuters, but I, I believe that good journalism costs money, it costs, it, co it takes resources, and someone has to pay for it. It is in all of our benefit uh, to have a strong fourth estate uh, for society. And if, if you guys aren't willing to pay for it, then who's gonna pay for it, right? Certainly not the special interests that we are covering, uh, and so, yeah, I think it's, yeah, of course, it, of course, it's better to have a free ice cream cone than one that you have to pay for. But if you think ice cream is good and you're willing to pay for an ice cream, maybe, you know, spend the money on a newspaper subscription or, you know, any sort of media news, you know. I think really it's, it's the old saying, there's no such thing as free lunch, right? Uh, you always have people to pay. Uh, either you pay as subscriber, or the advertiser would have to pay on your behalf. And in, in the case of uh, online media, of course, it's like whether you can find enough, uh, you can capture enough advertisement to sustain it. And for that to happen, let's go back to the other, the other side of data mining, the dark side of data mining. How, how do you actually make money from this? I mean that we, if we, we, we would then complain about that our privacy is being undermined when, when the, adver the advertiser come going, you know, mine into our data and so on and, and, and reconstruct our lifestyle pattern and network. But if you do not want that, then really as what Irene said, pay. Because otherwise no one is paying who is going to do that. There's a third possibility. You have people who are rich enough who just do it for free. But then, then you have a very small group of people who can afford to do that, and our world view will be shaped by them. So you really have to make a tough choice. If we, none of us want to pay, then it's either the commercial interests that take charge, or a small elite who can afford to do it for free, but then you have to depend on their benevolence and whether they can ever be representative of the worldview that we want? That's probably a big question. Ideally, I feel that news is a, is, is a public resource. It should be available to everyone. Uh, uh, but that's ideally. Uh, I, in, in that kind of situation, I feel it's either journalists need to, to live as well, so they need, they need to, to, to do especially investigative work. It's very expensive, so where's that money going to come from? I'm quite opposed to commercial uh, enterprises, but uh, the alternative often is state enterprises and state control. Uh, so I feel there is a need for something in between, uh, where there is funding provided by state, by the state, without the, without the implication of there being state control. Public service, essentially, the public service model, uh, which has to be developed, I guess, for, even for the new media. Or even community radios, for that matter, yeah, that kind of uh, uh, institutions. Uh, uh, I guess we'll take about two more questions on the floor. Yes, Pauline. And then maybe one of my students over there. 
Natalie, maybe next. Hi, my name is Pauline. Uh, this question is for Irene. Um, I think data journalism is a very interesting new development that's been happening ever since the data has um, given us a lot of information. But there have been um, talk about how this has actually made journalists be more, uh, you know, doing the research within the office itself and not going out and building resources. You know, what happened to good old-fashioned journalism? They're supposed to be going out to get resources too. Um, so what are your thoughts that's happening in the newsroom? Because I've been out of it for some time, so I'm just curious. Are journalists spending more time just combing data or uh, neglecting the fact that they have to go out and build sources? Is that what's happening? Thank you. I think that it's all very important. Um, and I think that as it's, I think that as a reporter, you cannot only rely on sources now. You have to be able to do that kind of research and some data mining. Um, it will only enhance your reporting. Uh, but it is not, you cannot get a good story just from looking at a database or looking on the internet. You actually have to talk to people. Sometimes um, the best combination is to have people team up together. So you have the people who really have no interest in computers, who like to just go out and talk to people all the time, and you build and who are very good at building sources, and you have them work with people who are more comfortable in a kind of looking at data and doing research and that sort of thing. Um, I think that's a traditional combination that's always been happening for a long time. Um, in the past, actually, what has happened is that the people who are good at talking to people, they're the ones who would have their name at the top of the story, and the people who were doing the data mining and the computer assisted reporting would not. I think what we see changing is that actually both of those people now are going to be at getting credit for the stories. Um, but I would say that no matter what kind of reporter you are, you need to at least be comfortable with doing a little bit of the other thing, uh, because no real story is going to be. I mean, you can't you can't get the best story uh, by only relying on one or the other. You really have to be able to combine both. Which means, actually, for you young people, you have to learn how to talk to people on the phone. It's really awkward, I know. Uh, people don't like talking on the phone anymore, but it's really hard to do an interview over text, and your thumbs will get tired. So, you know, if you can, if you don't like the phone, try to meet up with people in person. Buy them coffee. Can I just add one more line? I think the other part of it is that <coughs> many journalism students have a very strong ground in humanities, but great in quantitative studies, social sciences, and so on. They need to strengthen that part, because so that you can do a little bit of research on your own. And lastly, if I um, mean, there are amazing stories that can be found um, if you are willing to actually read academic articles, um, because you know academics are doing this kind of work all the time. The difference is that we write we write stories about people. We write stories that so that it makes it what is you know that very rigorous work that's been done um, interesting to a general audience. And I think that that's where understanding the quantitative part of it um, and being able to talk to people and crystallize um, an issue or a phenomenon or a trend um, in an actual story that people want to hear is um, where we have a good opportunity. Like that's, that's, that's where we specialize. We, we're not trying to become academics. We want to be able to uh, take the rigor of what they do and those techniques and strengthen the storytelling with that kind of rigor for us. Okay, uh, any uh, more questions from the students? Yes, this one. Question? Uh, my question is we met one week. You're based in Hong Kong, so I would presume that you have had dealings with mainland China, so, and since they have a reputation for censorship, I would like to know it, does it impede your work in any way? Uh, does it make it harder to work when it comes to them? Um, I have to say, from my own personal experience, I haven't had, I have not had personal dealings um, related to censorship of my work. Um, I, I do work for an international news organization, so it's a bit different. I mean, local reporters in China face much more, much, much more pressure. Um, I also report in English, which again is a is a bit different as well. Um, the level of scrutiny and pressure is is different. But we have seen in the past few years that certainly international news organizations such as Bloomberg and New York Times have 
faced repercussions for their reporting. And so this is something that obviously we're, you know, that you know, I think about. Um, mostly when I, in terms of, you know, what, what, what does it make me do in terms of um, my reporting? You know, it makes me think very carefully about, you know, how I, um, you know, my sourcing, how I talk to people. You know, you, you, if you were, you know, of course we always are very careful as reporters, but you want to be even more careful in terms of making sure that every fact that you are, you know, researching, that you can try to verify it, double verify it, triple verify it. You know, we just have to be, we, we have to be extra careful um, and, and really, really make a point to uh, ensure that anything that we report can be, will, will stand the test of time and scrutiny. <coughs> to my understanding, strangely enough, uh, most newspaper in China are actually controlled by either the government or the Communist Party or their branches. So some, you, you have provincial governments, prefectural government, or the newspaper. Uh, despite this fact, I find that many, not many, but there are enough of uh, Chinese journalists who are very brave and picking up all kinds of stories. And sometimes they get killed because they expose a story not all the time challenging the government. It could be just about food safety and all those issues. And, and what I find, uh, it contrasts uh, many Malaysian journalists simply simply lack that kind of well, that kind of determination to get out good stories. I mean, you, you heard so frequently foreign reporters commenting that how come my Malaysian counterparts are so quiet? And this is very obvious in the recent uh, MH370 case. Most of the tough questions were asked by foreigners. I think there's a lot of things that in you your agency more than the environment that you are in, the structure. Okay. Uh, any last comment from the panelists? They've been so patient. We should let them go into it. <laughs> They've been really good, huh? They've been really good. Okay. I think we have come uh, to the end of our session. And we'd like to thank our panelists here for answering all these questions. Thank you so much.